Let's begin talking about our biosphere. In order to begin talking about this, we need to begin at the, where it fits in the different levels of living things. So let's begin with the individual. This individual fits within a population of that same organism. All that population, along with other populations of animals, make up a community. And then all these different communities make up a, an ecosystem. And then all the different ecosystems of the world make up our biosphere. The biosphere is the thin shell around the earth in which all the known physically living things exist. On land, the biosphere extends to as deep as 4,000 meters below the surface where bacteria have been found. The lichens growing on the edge of the mountain snow caps are the highest limits of the terrestrial biosphere. So this represents the range of that. And the biosphere is composed of many ecosystems. So you can see how the ecosystem uh, fits within the biosphere. Here's a diagram to kind of help you picture that maybe a little bit better. The uh, heavily populated areas are, are really going to be just mostly on the surface of the earth and um, in the ocean or bodies of water it goes down a certain depth but then when you get either very deep in the water or very high in the atmosphere uh, it's very thin, thinly populated. Now habitat is um, a general term for the area where a type of organism lives. It's like it's a dress. Uh, the habitat, for instance, of a leopard frog is the edges of the pond or the quiet backwaters of a stream. And it includes um, both the abiotic environment the non-physical, uh, non-living things, and then the biotic community, which is made up of all the living things. What an organism does and how it fits into it and affects its habitat is its niche. Uh, it's sort of like that organism's occupation. What does it do? And it includes the abiotic and biotic conditions needed and how those conditions are used uh, by this organism. Two organisms may live in the same habitat, but if their uh, niche, niches are different, they are not in direct competition. Uh, they, for instance, like a ladybug and a grasshopper, they live in the same habitat, but uh, they're not in direct competition with each other. They occupy two separate niches in the same habitat. Okay, they live, they're in the same habitat, but just different niches. Uh, as an example of this niche, uh, where you can have different organisms living in the same area, Animals that have similar niches may avoid competition by feeding preference. For instance, here are three different warblers that are found living in the same tree, a spruce tree. At the very top, you have the Cape May warbler that feeds on the tips of branches near the top of the tree, and you, it doesn't uh, feed down lower. The bay-breasted warbler feeds in the middle part of the tree and then the yellow rumped warbler feeds on the lower parts of the tree and at the base uh, of the middle branches. So you can see that their range of feeding does not overlap each other. Another term that's often used in this discussion are um, the way these animals uh, fit within their niche. Uh, we have a group of animals that we call the generalists. They have a large niche because they tolerate a very wide range of conditions. Uh, 
We have the raccoon that you can find in many places in, in the U.S. They live um, out in the country. They also live here in the city. Um, another uh, species that is the uh, English house sparrow is also a generalist, and you can find it uh, pretty much everywhere in the U.S. Uh, it adapts very well to uh, different conditions, lives in the city, in the country, uh, up north where it's cold, down south where it's hot. If they're not generalists, then they may be specialists, and these have a very small niche, and there are they don't um, have much flexibility in their habitat conditions, such as this um, giant panda. The giant panda uh, feeds just on uh, euc uh, eucalyptus, and uh, so it's very uh, rigid in where it can uh, live, and so it won't live where its food source is not present. Okay. So their food preferences are very narrow. So that would be a specialist. Now, a competition will occur when we have two niches that overlap each other. Uh, for instance, the coyote and the fox. These two uh, have similar uh, niches. They eat similar animals. Let's take a look. A fox on the right has a, a rabbit in its mouth, and so the coyotes also eat r rabbits as well. So there's going to be a competition uh, between those two. Uh, another uh, example of competition that might happen in a garden where you have weeds growing and they're competing with those plants that we have put there purposefully, and they've grown up and they are uh, using the same nutrients, same water. Uh, as the desired plants, and they're competing with that. And whoever can get the most nutrients and water is going to be uh, the winner. So when one, uh, when two species in an area compete for the same resources, one may be more successful at the expense of the other. And in this situation, uh, one's going to end up replacing the other. In other words, one will no uh, will its numbers will slowly dwindle until they're uh, either in very few numbers or maybe they have totally uh, been excluded. Uh, as in the coyote and the fox, one will uh, maybe be able to compete better than the other in a certain set of conditions, and so the other species will often move. Um, to another area where there is less competition. So competitive exclusion is where one species replaces another. <clears throat> so let's review a little bit about matter and energy that's in our ecosystem. Uh, matter, if you remember, is uh, anything that has mass and occupies space. So it's all the, the physical things, uh, even the living things are made up of matter. Uh, energy is the um, ability to do work, and so living things need energy. Uh, our, uh, the different cycles, uh, carbon cycle, water cycle, they all need energy for that to, uh, to work as well. And then there's different types of energy. We have the kinetic energy, uh, molecular energy, where uh, the energy that atoms ha and molecules have because they are moving around. Uh, now, in the laws of thermodynamics is another thing to help us understand about energy. Uh, one of the laws says that matter can uh, or energy cannot be created or destroyed. And then another uh, law says that whenever energy is used, some of it becomes unuseful, as we saw in um, previous slides. So the quantity of available energy in a food chain becomes progressively smaller as it passes from one organism to the to the next. We learned earlier that roughly 
uh, 80 to 90 percent of the energy uh, is lost uh, as it passes to the the next level in the food chain. So when the last of the energy captured from the sun by the producer organism is released uh, in the decomposer organisms, that's kind of at the very end when things have died and the decomposer have taken over, uh, that energy is no longer available for use in the biotic community. So we need to have organisms that will capture this energy from the sun and make uh, and store more energy for those that will feed upon uh, the various uh, organisms. So everything alive must constantly be uh, have usable energy, but once it uh, has used or released some of the energy, that energy cannot be uh, reused. But matter, on the other hand, is cyclic which means that it can be repeatedly uh, reused. So matter that uh, like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen that we've, or even water uh, are parts of cycles and uh, they can be constantly be reused um, by the, uh, those that feed upon them or, uh, are just part of a cycle. They just keep being used over and over again. Uh, so atoms are of carbon, atoms of oxygen, atoms of nitrogen constantly are being uh, used by living things and then released often to the atmosphere and then the cycle begins all over again. So because these cycles involve chemicals that pass through the biosphere, but are also part of the Earth's system, they, uh, we take all those three ideas and put them together. They're referred to as the biogeochemical cycles. So carbon, oxygen, nitrogen uh, are needed by living things. They're part of the Earth's cycles and they're all chemicals. So biogeochemical uh, cycles. And that's the end of this section.